What's up, everybody? Waiting for next year.com podcast. Unfortunately, there's no guest today. I had two guests fall out, but actually they're going to be rescheduled for next week. In the meantime, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't let the week go without giving some more podcast content. I've got a lot of things to talk about and I wanted to make sure I got this stuff out there. Um, before I bailed on this week's guests. I was talking to TD about Arian Foster, and we were going to talk about Terrell Pryor. We we're going to talk about the Indians and NCAA. Now, as it turns out, next week uh, when I do get together with TD, there the brackets will be out. So all's well that ends well. Um, I also have another guest coming up next week that uh, that I'm really looking forward to, but I'm not going to jinx it and tell you about it now. So. Um, hopefully uh, it's not for lack of trying this week. There'll be a lot more guests next week, but, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about Arian Foster because, you know, he kind of took the internet by storm this week with his take on being able to kill a wolf, uh, which people went crazy over and I thought it was pretty funny, uh, ridiculous. And of course the photoshops started thereafter, which is always entertaining and he, I'm in the middle of listening to him talk to Joe Rogan, and I come to find out that Arian Foster is a ridiculously thoughtful guy. You know, um, I, I he seems intelligent. He's just, but even beyond the intelligence, he's just very well thought out and philosophical. It's like uh, he did reveal he's a philosophy major, but he seems like he does a lot of deep thinking about himself and his own place in the world and the world at large and everything else, even beyond, you know, just saying that he could kill a wolf, which is ridiculous or whatever. Um, and it, it's interesting because Joe Rogan was asking him about quitting on his NFL career and retiring and how that how he knew that he was ready to retire and knew that he was done. And Arian Foster was talking about sitting on the sidelines during a game and realizing that he didn't care who won or lost the game. And I'm sure that could infuriate a lot of NFL fans, especially uh, fans of the team for which Arian Foster played. But it's, 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 it's something that I've really come to learn as a fan of pro sports over the last 10 years or so. Because I used to be one of those crazed fans that felt like all players should care as much as I do at all times because they've got big contracts and they're making big money, big money to play a kid's game or, or you know, whatever those cliches turn out to be without really putting any thought into the idea that, oh, yeah, they're like actually humans who have feelings and motivations and the relativity of all this stuff, you know, th this idea that. If you're out there making 40000 a year or you're out there making $140,000 a year, there are times in your life that other people would think are really important and the stakes are high because of your paycheck that they don't have, that they wish they had. And you you take things, you take days off, you you mail it in at times. And to think that pro athletes, just because they're in front of 70,000 people in person and millions at home, and the fact that they make millions of dollars, to, to think that they wouldn't be subject, subject to the same human emotions and motivations and ups and downs that the rest of us are subject to, it's crazy. It's crazy. And so when Arian Foster – I was almost encouraged. I was, I was almost uh, – you know – it was humanizing for him to hear him say, look, man, I knew I was done because I didn't care who won or lost. And I'm sitting on the sidelines and I just couldn't make myself care. You know, he talked about having played uh, as a an undrafted rookie with a broken collarbone. He played with a broken collarbone for two years without telling anybody because his money wasn't guaranteed yet. And if he had told anybody they wouldn't have maybe given him money. And so he knowingly didn't take care of himself, didn't heal the way that he knew he should have healed in order to get the money and knew he had to play it that way. And so he signs the big contract and two weeks later he goes and he says, oh, by the way, I've been playing with a broken collarbone for two weeks. 
now that he's got his guaranteed money. Is that dirty? Is that wrong of him as a player? I I don't think so. I mean, he went out there and he earned all that money as an undrafted player and he put all that all the all those yards up and all those touchdowns together on the field with a broken collarbone, finally got his guaranteed money and then admitted that that he'd been playing with a broken all that time. Did he kind of trick them? It, would would they have given him the same contract if they'd known that he had a broken collarbone? Probably not, but uh, it's hard to fault him. It's hard to fault him. You know, you want these guys to be warriors and you want them to be this, that, and the other thing that we, we pump them up to be with all those superlatives. And then when a guy is in a situation where he, he does all that as an undrafted guy, finally makes some money, it's just hard to blame him. And every situation in the NFL is unique, but these these guys are just people in the end. You know, I talked to Scott Rabb about it this week. Thanks to everybody who's listened to that one so far. It's a very heavily downloaded podcast. So I, I appreciate everybody coming and listening. Uh, and anybody who missed Scott Rabb, you should you should check it out. Um, but I talked to him about, you know, just one example of this was Iman Shumpert. And, you know, him playing during the Cavaliers championship season with a brand new baby and all those different life changes going on. And, and we don't expect players to be impacted by that. And we expect them to, to not live the same kind of realities of family and home and relationship life that the rest of us do. And it's unrealistic. It's, it's ridiculous. And so, uh, Arian Foster, uh, I haven't, as I said, I haven't heard the end of the interview with, uh, with Joe Rogan, but you should totally check it out. He, he's a fascinating guy. Um, it'd be interesting to see what he does after football. Um, so check that out. In the meantime, the, the Cleveland Browns are making moves. Um, a lot of people are upset at this point that Terrell Pryor remains unsigned and the Browns have come to some sort of an agreement, it seems, with Kenny Britt, uh, who is, I think, a 28-year-old receiver, um, been been in the league a few years, and it's a it's a strange thing. It's a it's a strange thing because there's this idea that I've been I've been you know professing on this podcast and on the pages of Waiting for Next Year that a free agent is worth more to the team if they already have him and he's used to their system and there's some commonality of of knowledge and playbook and language and all these different things that your own free agents if they're worth signing at all should be worth more to you than anybody else and so i expected them to get a deal done with terrell Pryor, just because first of all i, I i'm not sure that eight nine ten million exists anywhere other than cleveland for terrell Pryor. who values a guy who made a position switch and proved it for one year more than the team that was there to watch it in the front row. It's hard to imagine there was a $12 million deal, for example, sitting out there available to Rel Pryor with another team. I always kind of assumed the Browns were the high bidder, and maybe they still are. Maybe they will be. Maybe they will get to Rel Pryor in addition to Kenny Britt. But right now, it's very confusing to me. I don't know if it's the Browns' fault or or maybe Drew Rosenhaus and Terrell Pryor overvaluing the market for themselves. I, I've certainly read that on Twitter from a number of NFL reporters that they seem to think that Drew Rosenhaus and Terrell Pryor overvalued, overplayed their hand a little bit uh, in terms of what the market would be for w- receivers and specifically Terrell Pryor. I, it's just... It's all very strange, and it it's kind of disconcerting to me to watch the Browns conduct themselves this way. Um, they The Browns have long since uh, proven that they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt, and that's not me being mean. I, it just it came across my my not my time hop, but the, the this this day in in history on Facebook today today. March 9th is the anniversary of when the Cleveland Browns lost the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean that Sashi Brown and Paul D. Podesta and Hugh Jackson and the rest of them and Andrew Barry aren't going to be able to do good things and rebuild this team, but they don't have the benefit of the doubt because of this day a year ago 
when they lost both Alex Mack and Mitchell Schwartz. That's the day. That's the moment. Um, it, again, it doesn't doom them forever and ever and ever, but it just goes to show that the Cleveland Browns made a mistake and they made a mistake that they, they couldn't come back from to the tune of a 1-15 in 15 season. It was bad in the moment. It was bad in that they didn't react well enough to make up for it. And that is that is why, even though Sashi Brown and his crew don't have to necessarily own up to the mistakes of all the regimes prior, but they're already on notice. They've been on notice almost from the moment they took the job because the one of the first opportunities to really make a move, all they did was let everybody leave. You know, it was okay when Travis Benjamin left. It was maybe okay when Tashawn Gibson left. But to lose Benjamin, Gibson, Schwartz, Mack, and on and on and on, that that is inexcusable. That was never going to work. And it didn't work. And some will say that the Browns didn't want to win this year anyway. But tell me that there's a, a good strategy in losing free agents about ready to cash in on their first deal who've earned that first deal in their 20s, like Mitchell Schwartz. You know, you can make the case of, of a great many things being strategically good, even if on their face they make you worse, especially in the, in the NFL, which is a salary cap league. But there's just no way to justify certain things. And Terrell Pryor not returning to the Browns might be one of those things. Now, tr nobody knows Terrell Pryor at this point better than Hugh Jackson and the Browns, both as a player and as a locker room presence. And maybe they've knowingly discounted him or discounted their uh, their need to, to, to have him on their team because of those factors. Maybe there are things going on that we don't know. Or maybe they just made the highest offer and this is Drew Rosenhaus and Terrell Pryor's fault. It's it's hard to speculate at this point. There's just too many there are too many variables yet to play out. But it's hard to imagine a scenario where Terrell Pryor leaves the Browns and unless the Browns somehow make a trade or, or find another receiver that this isn't another Mitchell Schwartz kind of a situation. This is, yes, the Browns broke the bank for Jamie Collins, which was a good thing. Uh, that's That was the right move. You don't make that trade and bring that guy in and then screw around and not re-up him and keep him around. And they did. So that's a good thing. But they they that doesn't give them benefit of the doubt over the Terrell Pryor situation and everything else. And, and Kenny signing Kenny Britt while – seemingly a positive thing in general doesn't necessarily provide you air cover for not getting Terrell Pryor done. I'm sorry. It just doesn't not in my book. Maybe it does for the rest of you. I, so the Browns are still on notice and they, uh, they're still on notice for a number of reasons, a number of things. And they, they have a lot of questions to answer a lot more than what maybe they would even hope that they have to answer. Um, at this point, the Bills keep Tyrod Taylor. So the Browns have no answer at quarterback still, unless they make some kind of a, a maneuver. Uh, I, I just, I don't even know what a good maneuver would be. You know, they've got RG3 and Cody Kessler. That's something. Does anybody want them to sign Mike Glennon? Uh, if you could see my face right now, I don't want them to sign Mike Glennon, not for anything. Mike Glennon, so many of these quarterbacks are like like when I talked about Luol Deng. Like they're just not, they're never going to be the key to winning. Luol Deng is never going to be your key to winning. He costs just enough money to be kind of painful and take up space, but he's never good enough to take you from level B to level A. He's never good enough to take you from a a the a sixtieth you know you know uh, sixty percentile team up into the upper nineties. You know he's he's never that piece. 
he could be that piece if he costs two million dollars or three million dollars. But when he costs fourteen or fifteen million dollars, it's just it's never going to work. And that's the same thing. Like a guy like Mike Glennon, if he's your backup and you need him to make three starts in the middle of the season, and he costs you four and a half to six million dollars as your backup quarterback, he could be a very key piece to winning and making the playoffs. If he needs to start. 12 14 or entire season he is he is a disaster for your roster he is a ceiling kind of a player it's no good it's no good and rg3 is probably that way too i'm i'm a proponent of keeping rg3 on the if come i think that in in the realm of of quarterbacks he is a luxury as a backup that you need to step up and play three games in a season he he is a he is a luxury in that kind of a in that kind of a scenario, and so, but the Browns need more than the backup luxury at this point. They need the starting luxury, and there's no path that I can see to getting it. I just don't I don't see what the path is, and it's very frustrating. It feels like the plans aren't coming together. Whether we're talking about Terrell Pryor or whether we're talking about uh, quarterbacks that aren't coming to fruition. And the fact that this draft apparently is one of the worst in terms of draft prospects at quarterback, that's unlucky. It's hard to blame the 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 uh, Harvard brain trust on that one, but it's uh it's it's just the it's what they it's the the hand they're dealt. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter you know, what kind of bad fortune falls your way, you have to come up with a quarterback anyway, or you're going to be out of a job. You, that's the way, that's the way the system works. Um, okay. Other, other Browns news that came across the wire today, uh, according to uh, pro football talk, and I'm sure by the time you're listening to this, it'll be confirmed or we'll have more details, but the Cleveland Browns signed Joel Petonio to a quote unquote monster deal. Um, he was scheduled to become a free agent in 2018. Uh, Adam Schefter is reporting that it's a monster. And uh, normally, I would say that that's a really good thing. But I'm a little bit nervous about this one. Um, Joel Batonio finished the season with a foot injury. I believe it was Liz Frank, which is like a really big deal. I, I never want to speculate about a guy's injuries in terms of, you know, questioning his toughness. And I won't do that with Batonio either because I, I do think he's a tough guy and I think he's a very good player. But what I do know about List Frank is that it's not like a it's not like a simple thing. You know, when Alex Mack broke his leg, it sucked. But it was like kind of a clean break and you knew he would, you, you know, there's a very high chance of, of healing really well. You know, a standard ACL injury, like they're kind of a predictable thing. We feel very good about them. But a foot injury, a list Frank foot injury on a 300 pound lineman, that's that's a little bit scary. And so the Browns giving a monster deal to a guy coming off a list Frank injury when he's got another year of, of play and, and maybe I, how here's the question, something that we've been asking behind the scenes at waiting for next year, again, not questioning the toughness of Joel Batonio, but just trying to look realistically at an injury without, without going overboard and, and getting hot takey with the speculation and saying, He's not going to play in 2017. It's more like a question. Is he going to play in 2017? Is he going to be able to play? List Frank is a scary foot injury. Um, so, I, I mean, we'll obviously we'll wait and see on this one. I don't want to, again, I said I, I don't want to get overreactive with this whole thing. But uh, And normally, this is exactly the kind of maneuver you want to make. You find a guy in the draft who's worth the money. You identify him early. You pay him his money to lock him up through the the key uh, the the key years of his career, his most productive years, and you do so a little bit early because maybe that's a more efficient way of of getting the deal done because that that signing bonus gets off your books 
faster. Maybe there's a roster bonus, so you you load some guaranteed money in the first year when you've got tons of cap space so that by the time he's finishing out that contract, maybe his cap number is only like five or six million, even though you know you've paid him all this guaranteed money that made him you know uh one of the top line top paid linemen for his first two seasons you know that this is how nfl contracts work this is how you game legally game the salary cap you front load deals i believe there's a six million dollar roster bonus in the jamie collins deal for example somewhere in that ballpark that's a front loaded thing so that the browns take all of that six million cap hit in the first year so that makes him more affordable down the road in in theory that's the idea you front load the guaranteed money um and then and then if you restructure later if a guy proves in the middle of a four-year deal that he's going to be worth it in the third and fourth year you convert this money to a signing bonus so that you can lower his cap number even further there are all these different games you can play so we'll see what the browns did with joel batonio um again you know, we don't like to do a lot of breaking news on the podcast, but it's interesting. It's interesting and it's worth talking about. And uh, I, I really do hate um, speculating too much about guys and injuries and all these kinds of things. But as long as you're not questioning a guy's toughness, I think it's worth talking about. I think it's worth talking about. You know, if a guy has an ACL, we know he's going to be back in six months. You, you just... You, you have to wonder. You have to wonder about Joel Batonio. But then again, the Browns know, should have the opportunity to know more than anybody else. So um, we'll see what happens there. I think that's it for me today. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of things that I wanted to touch on other than that. But um, And I, obviously, I wanted to have a bunch of uh, guests this week. It just didn't happen. And Skype stinks. Skype was not working for me today. That was the the other reason that the uh, the TD podcast fell by the wayside. But we're going to fix it up next week. Hopefully, we'll have a ton of guests next week. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. This podcast is brought to you by Patreon. We do things for our listeners at Patreon. P a t r e o n dot com forward slash w f n y. P a t r e o n dot com forward slash w f n y. If you can't support us there, at least uh, retweet it, tell a friend, do something. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye.